He has appeared on the History Channel's The Universe, Science Channel's Through the wor wor Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, and last uh, spring, early summer, uh, I got to see Sean on Comedy Central, The Colbert Report, where he was given immediately five minutes to make his point. Not enough time. <laughs> Not enough time for someone of, of, of Sean's ability. Uh, he is the author of Space, Time, and Geometry, and has also recorded a set of lectures for the teaching company entitled Dark Matter, Dark Energy, The Dark Side of the Universe. His most recent book, released in January of last year, is on the arrow of time entitled From Eternity to Here, which will be the point of his thing here. Uh, well, in one of his blogs, Sean asked the question, does anyone ever have a favorite class that they ever had? And Sean then blogged what his favorite undergraduate class was, as well as grad class. He says, my favorite undergraduate class here at Villanova, and I read this for the sake of our undergraduates, especially those of you who are freshmen. How many freshmen are here? Uh, for those, oh, for those of us who are freshmen, uh, Sean took the earliest version of ACS in the honors program. It was called Interdis. And the ACS class that you're taking now, which is why some of you are here, was a class that first was tested for 20 years in the honors program before it was turned into a course that every student at Villanova takes in all four colleges. So Sean knows what you're going through because he went through it um, back in 1985, in the fall of 85. Um, he says, my favorite undergraduate class was taught by a philosopher turned social theorist. We covered a lot of political and social theory, Marx, Rawls, Habermas, Strauss, McIntyre, that kind of thing. It was a small seminar, like ACS is, and an indispensable ingredient of the class's awesomeness was the talent and enthusiasm of the other students. Every week we were wrestling with big ideas about virtue and the good, and some of the best conversations were over breakfast at the dining hall before class. And years later, when Clarence Thomas said something about natural law at his confirmation hearings, we all knew exactly what he meant. Well, that's exactly the sort of thing that we try to do in ACS so that we have someone who is a graduate arts X number of years later blogging about how in a class that's interdisciplinary in character and asks big picture questions uh, is something taken by people who are going to become well known in their field in, in astrophysics. Sean's talk today is on the origin of the universe in the arrow of time. It will go about an hour. Um, afterwards, if you desperately need to go get dinner at 5.30, we will give you about 30 seconds of silence to get up and leave. Otherwise, the Q&A will last till about 6 o'clock. And I would encourage everyone, including our first year students, to stay. And one of the things we do in this kind of talk is that we, ask, we give the students the uh, opportunity to ask the first question. So it's a good reason to stay is after you hear Sean, you'll, you'll have a question and he'll, and he'll take your questions. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, someone who is uh, truly one of the, my, my favorite students I've ever taught in my life, Sean Carroll. Thank you. There's some room here, yeah. Someone must want to sit down, no? That's okay. So who, who taught that class that was my favorite class anyway? Uh, uh, it's great to be here. You know, uh, it's uh, the arrow of time, which is my subject today, has a special poignancy when you come back to give a talk at the place you graduated from 23 years ago, uh, half your lifetime ago, and you see that, you know, there is change over time. It is, it is sometimes gradual, sometimes sudden, hopefully uh, in, the, in an improving direction. I think there's a lot of great things happening here at Villanova. And, uh, and hopefully the talk will, even though it's a physics talk, hopefully it will be interesting uh, to a wider spectrum of ideas. The reason why this is a fun topic to talk about to a general audience is because I'm connecting these two things. The origin of the universe, which you live in, so that's important. And the arrow of time, this the difference between the past and the future. This is something you don't need to be a professional physicist to come in contact with every day. The arrow of time is absolutely crucial to how we live our lives. And yet, I'm going to try to convince you that it is connected in an intimate way to the origin of the universe, something that uh, we don't necessarily have to deal with, you think, in your everyday life. So I will succeed if I get to bring these two ideas together. And I'll, I'm leaving you not with answers, but with mysteries. The, the biggest lesson here is that we don't know all the answers yet. There's, and 
I'm too old to come up with the answers. You know, I, the, the great physicists and thinkers do all their work in their 20s. So my job is to inspire you so that when you're giving your Nobel Prize lecture, you mention, I get, went to this great talk at Villanova that really inspired me to think of these ideas. That's the best I can really hope for. Uh, that's the arrow time for you right there. The first question anyone has when we uh, talk about the subject is, what is time? And, and I want to emphasize, this is not a mystery, this question. There's a lot, there will be mysteries later. But what time is, is something that we understand. It seems mysterious sometimes, mostly because it means different things. The same word has different meanings depending on the context. So the first and most obvious, sort of easy, straightforward meaning of time is just as a label on the universe. Time tells you when you are. Time says that 11 o'clock is earlier than 12 o'clock. And this is not at all confusing, okay? When you are told there was a lecture at 4.30, you do not go, wow, what does that mean? That's really deep. You know how to deal with the fact that the lecture's at 4.30, the TV show is an hour long, and so forth. These are concepts we can deal with. Time is a coordinate in this sense. A, a physicist would say that there's something called space-time in which we live. There's space all around us, three dimensions of that. And there's another dimension called time which labels points in the history of the universe. So this particular event we're at right now is labeled by its location in this room and the moment of time in which it's happening. You need both of those pieces of information to find yourself in the universe. If you're going to take a train, you need to know where the train is leaving from, the station and the track, and you need to know when it is leaving. But of course, time marches, time changes from point to point, and there's a continuity of the universe through time that doesn't exist through space. From, a, from point to point in space, you might have you know, uh, wood and lectern, nothing. If you go very far away, you get something very different. Whereas from moment to moment in time, the universe only changes gradually. So you have you and your pet, and your pet notices that you're not paying enough attention and sort of slowly walks away. But it's not a wholesale rearrangement of the stuff in the universe from moment to moment in time. This is one of the things that physics needs to explain. Another thing is, you notice that when we try to talk about time, the first thing we do is we put clocks, digital clocks, analog clocks, what have you. How do we tell time? How do we measure time? At the most primitive level, a clock is just something that does the same thing over and over again in a repetitive, predictable way. What do you mean by predictable? You mean that a clock is something that repeats itself in a deterministic, predictable number of times compared to another clock. And that might make you nervous. You, you're, you think that might be a circular definition. But the fact is the universe is full of clocks. The universe is full of things that do the same thing over and over again compared to other things. The earliest useful clocks were astronomical. You might not be able to see this very well. Maybe I can make it uh, a little more visible. We're doing experimental science here. Yeah, that experiment failed. <laughs> <laughs> this experiment, I could do better. Let's just go back to this, and you can complain if it's uh, not quite dark enough. These are the planets. You've seen them. There's eight of them. There were nine of them when I was at Villanova. <laughs> there are eight of them now. We use the planets to tell the time. At the simplest level, every time the Earth uh, revolves around the sun, it rotates around its axis 365 and a quarter times. That's predictable. We know that's going to happen. You have a watch. You know that every time the little hand goes around once, the big hand goes around 12 times. It's predictable. That's how we, we tell time. It's the same general principle that we tell space by meter sticks. There's a meter stick. There's sort of the standard meter stick in a, in a laboratory in Paris, and you know that all meter sticks are the same length compared to each other. We also, however, feel time passing. Not only does time pass, but there's some personal experience. The next question people always have is, yeah, well, if there are all these clocks, how come sometimes it seems like time is passing faster and sometimes it's passing slower? And I'm here to tell you this is your fault, not the laws of physics's <laughs> fault, okay? That's because you have clocks inside you. You have things that happen over and over again, predictably and repetitively, but your clocks are less accurate than the clocks given to us by nature. So you have your heartbeat. You have your breathing. You have the pulses and the rhythms of your central nervous system. The accumulation of these helps us to tell what time it is, experience the passage of time. But it depends on whether or not you've had a cup of coffee, whether or not you're excited or bored, how fast these rhythms actually occur. One of the early uh, examples of this was this guy, Galileo, 
He was uh, a young boy in Pisa, and he went to church at the, the cathedral in Pisa, which is right next to the Leaning Tower. You can still go there. And I know not like anyone else in this room, but Galileo was occasionally bored during the church services. Mm -hmm. And so because he was Galileo and not you or me, he was observing the chandelier rocking back and forth. And now we would do that, but we would go, look at the pretty chandelier. <laughs> Galileo says, you know, like sometimes I'm here and the chandelier is really shaken and sometimes it's only a little bit, but it seems to take the same amount of time to go back and forth, whether it's moving a lot or moving just a little. I wonder if this is a law of nature. So he said, I want to time the chandelier and see if it really is regular, to see if it's the same time, the same frequency of oscillation. And again, because he was Galileo, he decided to use the nearest available clock, namely his pulse. So he sat there during the sermon counting the number of uh, oscillations of the chandelier and comparing them to the number of heartbeats on successive weeks. And he discovered that the oscillation of a pendulum is indeed independent of its amplitude. A pendulum is a clock. It's a predictable, it depends on the weight and it depends on the length. It does not depend on how far it is going. That's why we have grandfather clocks. That's why every physics major learns the simple harmonic oscillator, the very, very basic predictable clock. The physics majors in the audience are going, oh yeah, we've learned that. Uh, so that's why time is like space. In both time and space, we measure things. We locate things in the universe. We use instruments that are regular and predictable to do that measuring. But nobody mistakes time for space. You can, uh, you know, if, like I said um, on the Colbert Report, you can be walking down a new city and you can make a left turn instead of a right turn. That happens all the time. No one takes the wrong turn into yesterday. <laughs> time and space are clearly very different. And why is that? It's because unlike space, time has a direction. It seems to be very, very fundamental about the nature of time that the past is different from the future. If you are, uh, of course, space has a direction too. If I take this laser pointer and I drop it, it will always move in the same direction, the direction which we call down. There's a difference between up and down here in this room. But if you go in a spacesuit, you go far away from the influence of the Earth, there is no preferred direction. You can do a physics experiment, you get the same result no matter what orientation and no matter what direction you're looking in. Therefore, we say the directionality of space here in this room is not a deep down feature of reality. It's a local condition because we're being influenced by an influential object, the Earth. Time, on the other hand, seems to have an arrow built into it. There's just no way to mistake the past for the future. Here we have the arrow of time illustrated in some different circumstances. Here's different pictures, and in each case, I've, I've drawn an arrow with the word time on it. So th there you go, the arrow of time. Now you know what it is. But the important lesson of these pictures is that I didn't have to draw that arrow. If I show you these two cars, you know which one is the earlier one and which one is the later one. If I show you these two kings of rock and roll, you know which is the young one and which is the older one. If I show you this succession of species, you know what is going on. In all of these different ways, there are things that are changing through time in the same sense, over and over again. Nobody is born old and then dies young. You know, it's always this, the Benjamin Button notwithstanding. We're always born, then live, then die in that order. You can take an egg and you can make it into an omelet. You cannot take an omelet and turn it back into the egg. There are processes that happen in the same direction over and over again. That's the arrow of time. We remember the past and not the future. And we, we expect that this arrow is absolutely consistent throughout the universe. We can imagine meeting an alien civilization based on very different biology and chemistry and certainly different social institutions. We don't imagine there will ever be an alien civilization that turns omelets into eggs or the indigenous equivalent thereof. So what is going on? Why is there this difference between time and space? If they're both coordinates on the universe, why does time have a direction but space doesn't? Well, that mystery grows deeper when you start studying physics and you learn the deep down laws of physics. And the reason why you study physics is because physics is easy. Physics is much easier than sociology or political science or philosophy because physicists instantly go for the simplest possible thing that they can possibly think of. So physicists like things like this, two balls banging into each other. They simplify everything away. This goes back to Galileo who said, everything you drop will fall at the same rate. And you, and you say to Galileo, 
that's not true. I can drop things that don't follow the same rate. And he goes, oh, I forgot. You have to ignore air resistance and stuff like that. You have to ignore all the stuff that gets in the way. You simplify down to the essence. And what you find ever since Galileo, whether it's Galileo or Newton or Einstein or superstring theory, what you find is that when you simplify the physical laws down to their basic essences, there is no directionality to time. There's no difference between the past and the future intrinsically buried in the fundamental laws of physics. So when these two balls bounce into each other, here's what it means for there to be no directionality to time. If I made a movie of this, so these are two billiard balls on a physicist's billiard table, which means uh, there's no friction, there's no noise, there's nothing. It just goes according to Newton's laws. I make a movie of this, of the balls bouncing into each other and scattering off, and I play you the movie backwards. You would not notice. You would not know anything weird was going on. The balls bouncing into each other and scattering off works equally well, played either direction of time. That is a deep down feature of the individual laws of physics. Where the arrow of time comes in, where the difference between the past and the future comes in, is when things become complicated. When you get lots of different things going on. So if you have many billiard balls and you rack them nicely, then in your experience you know that you can hit them with a cue ball and they will scatter. That happens all the time. You probably know that if you take a whole bunch of scatter billiard balls and you smack the cue ball, they never arrange themselves like this. That doesn't happen. Time goes this way, but not that way. If I made a movie of this and played it backward, you would instantly know something weird was going on. So the arrow of time somehow creeps in when we go from the very simple stuff to the slightly more complicated stuff. So as scientists, we want to quantify what is exactly going on here. Well, what's going on is that the universe is getting messier with time. If I showed you this picture and this picture and I said no one was let, allowed to clean up the room, you would know that this was earlier and this was later. You, some of you in this room may have experienced this phenomenon of the universe getting messier with time. We can clean things up. You know, if, it's a, if, if it's what a physicist would call an open system, if we walk in there and exert energy, exert effort, we can turn this into this. But left to its own devices, the universe gets messier. If you have a pile of papers on your desk, you can imagine that over time they would get scattered. If you scatter papers all over your desk, over the course of time they are not going to clean themselves up into a nice neat pile. That is the underlying phenomenon behind every single manifestation of the arrow of time. Every difference between one direction of time and the other, between the past and the future, is ultimately because disorderliness is increasing in the universe. And we attach to this a technical term. We call it entropy. Entropy measures how messy things are, how chaotic, how disorderly, how disorganized things are. Messier things have a higher entropy. Organized things have a lower entropy. So if you plot what happens as a function of time, the entropy goes up. You start with an egg, unbroken, clean, pristine, organized. You can break it. It's a little messier. You can scramble it. It's messier still. That happens all the time. The inverse process doesn't. This is so important, it's a law of physics. It's the second law of thermodynamics. If you want to bet on a law of physics that we will still think is true a thousand years from now, bet on this one. This is going to stick around. This is the, the example that C.P. Snow in his Two Cultures essay, he wanted to pick an example of what is something that to a scientist has the same status that Shakespeare's plays has to a humanist. He picked the second law of thermodynamics. This is the one thing he thought that everyone in the world should know. And he's right. Let me just, without uh, giving you anywhere near enough argument to establish the following random claims I'm going to be making, let me just tell you how important the increase of entropy is. Again, it is the thing responsible for all the differences between the past and future in the world. The fact that you're born and then you die, that's ultimately because of the increase of entropy. Biological evolution, the particular way it plays out, is all because entropy is increasing. The fact that you remember one direction but not the other. I can remember yesterday but not tomorrow. Cause and effect. So I could, everyone agrees that if I, you know, we decided right now, oh, tomorrow night let's have Chinese food for dinner. You might not agree with that culinary choice, but it's a sensible, logical sentence to construct. But if I said, okay, let's agree last night to have had Indonesian food doesn't make sense. I can't make a decision now about what I had last night because I think I can affect with my choices now what will happen in the future but not what did happen in the past. The past is settled. It's in the books. The future is up for grabs. Why? Because entropy is increasing. 
ultimately. So this is a picture drawn by Roger Penrose about how this plays out in our, in our local environment. If entropy were maximal, if we were as disorderly as we could get, like my dorm room looked sometimes when I was a Villanova undergraduate, we call that equilibrium, thermal equilibrium. And nothing can happen in thermal equilibrium. You're as maximally messy as you can be. You're as scattered, as disorganized as it can get. And if that's true, then everything is uniform. Everything is the same everywhere. Our local environment is not like that. The sun is a hot spot in a very cold sky, a very cold sky some days. What this means is that if the whole sky were the temperature of the sun, here on Earth, we would come to the temperature of the sun and life would end. If the whole sky were the temperature of the night sky, we would come to the temperature of the night sky and life would end. The reason why there is life, the reason why there is metabolism, growth, evolution, thought, action, is because you have both the hot sun and the dark night sky. We get energy from the sun and we radiate it back. We don't get energy overall from the universe. The Earth gives back to the universe almost exactly the same amount of energy as it gets from the sun. What, what point is the sun? The energy we get from the sun is low entropy. We give it back to the universe high entropy. Quantitatively, this means that for every one photon of light we get from the sun, we give back 20 photons of light. We get visible light, we radiate in the infrared, for those physicists out there. We are an entropy generating machine, and the only reason that's possible is because we're very far from equilibrium here on Earth. If it weren't like that, nothing would ever happen. So good, that's progress. We know a phenomenon, entropy goes up. We have a technical term to attach to it and a law of physics. This is all very good. It gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. Why is it like that? Why does entropy tend to increase? So this was more or less answered in the 19th century by this guy, Ludwig Boltzmann. He was an Austrian physicist. And I like to say you know, to my students, Boltzmann, he, he has everyone, every physics student's dream. He has an equation on his tombstone. And so as you go through your life, you should be thinking, what is the equation that will be on my tombstone? This is what you should all have in mind as you live your life. Boltzmann's equation is his explanation for entropy. So in the 1870s, the physicists hadn't really caught on to what we now call atoms. The chemists had caught on. They deserve credit. But the physicists were still skeptical. You can't see these little atoms. Why can you believe in things you can't see? This is an ancient argument that is always brought up in these circumstances. People like Boltzmann said, look, because the idea of entropy was already around, but they didn't know what it was. They thought maybe it was a fluid that moved from place to place. Boltzmann said, no, no, it's not a fluid. It's a property of the atoms. If you believe in atoms, then I can explain to you what entropy is. Entropy is just a, num is a way of counting how many ways I can arrange the atoms without changing what something looks like. So if I have, for example, this is supposed to be coffee and cream, uh, with time, they mix. They never unmix. The arrow of time goes this way. This is more organized. This is more messy. So Boltzmann says, look, over here, you can't see every atom or every molecule of cream or coffee. You don't see the position and the velocity of every single one. You see some gross macroscopic features. There are many ways that I could rearrange the molecules in the milk or the cream, and you would never notice. But there's not a large number of ways, because if I start mixing the cream with the coffee, then you begin to notice. The configuration of the coffee and the cream, whereas the largest number of ways I can mix things without you noticing, is when things are totally mixed up. Highest entropy. Boltzmann's equation says that the entropy just counts the number of ways I can arrange the atoms while keeping things macroscopically looking the same to you. So one way of doing this, to be a little bit abstract about it, this is the space of all possible arrangements of some set of atoms. This is high entropy means there are many, many arrangements that look the same. Low entropy means there are few arrangements that look the same. So here is the arrangement where there's cream and coffee separate. Here is the arrangement when they're all mixed together. So Boltzmann says, look, now it's obvious why entropy increases. There are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. If you start in a low entropy state and just let the universe go, chances are overwhelmingly high that entropy will increase because there's more places to be high entropy. I have therefore explained the second law of thermodynamics. And he's right. All of that stuff is exactly correct, except for one little tiny piece that the logic didn't quite fit. Namely, why was the entropy ever low to begin with? 
Boltzmann can explain to us if the entropy of the universe or some little subpart of the universe is low, if the universe is organized, why it becomes disorganized. In other words, he can explain why starting today, the entropy of the universe will be higher tomorrow. What he can't explain is why starting today the entropy of the universe was lower yesterday. There's nothing in the equations, nothing in his formalism that will explain that. And he fought against this realization. He and his contemporaries tried to prove that entropy must go up. But they couldn't because the fundamental laws of physics don't tell the difference between past and future. There is no difference there. The difference between the past and the future is that the past was the direction in which the entropy was really low. And that is not explained by Boltzmann's way of looking at things. It is asserted. In other words, why is there an arrow of space? Because we're not in a randomly selected part of the universe. We are under the influence of an important object, the Earth. Why is there an arrow of time? Because we're not in a randomly selected configuration of the universe. We are in the aftermath of an important event, the Big Bang. This is a cosmology question at heart. Boltzmann can tell you why the entropy will be higher tomorrow, just statistically. But if you ask, why was the entropy of the universe lower yesterday? The answer is because it was even lower the day before yesterday. And you say, well, why was that, that it was lower the day before yesterday? It's because it was even lower than that the day before the day before yesterday. And these are not cheats. That's the right answer. And that logic goes all the way back 13.7 billion years to the beginning of the universe. So let this sink in. The reason why you can decide what to have for dinner tomorrow but not what to have dinner yesterday is because of the Big Bang. It's because the conditions early in the history of the universe were delicately arranged, and the, the space of possibilities was enormously smaller in the past than in the future. That's why you grow old. That's why you remember a different direction. That's why your notion of free will is different than your notion of history. So why is it like that? Why was the early universe low entropy? It's beyond Boltzmann now. He didn't know. He died in 1906. He didn't know about the Big Bang, about general relativity, about quantum mechanics, etc. This is our job. So let's start. I'm going to make it a little dark in the room just for a second because you got to see this picture in all of its glory. This is the universe. This is what you would get if you had a camera and you pointed the camera at a blank region of the sky where there was nothing there and you just kept the shutter open and your camera was attached to the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> you would see that even though you thought the, it was blank, as long as you collect enough photons, it lights up with all these little <coughs> blobs. Every one of those blobs is a galaxy. We live in a galaxy, a collection of stars, the Milky Way galaxy. There's about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. On average, they each have 100 billion stars in them. 100 billion is the only number you need to know. Uh, the age of the universe is 100 billion if you measure in dog years. <laughs> Don't know what that means, but it's a true fact. So 100 billion galaxies, 100 billion stars per galaxy spread uniformly through the universe. So you can argue there's at least a reasonable chance that every one of these galaxies with 100 billion stars has planets and life and universities and talks and uh, basketball conferences and the whole bit. We want to explain this. Well. The nice thing is, it is changing. The universe is not stuck there. We know in our lives the universe is changing. The whole shebang is also changing, and it's getting bigger, which I guess is a good direction to go in. Edwin Hubble discovered this. The universe is expanding. What does that mean? That means if you look at one of those galaxies and measure its velocity, the distant galaxies are all moving away from us. And the more distant ones are moving away faster. So it's not that we're at the middle or people don't like us in the universe. Every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. The whole thing is expanding. And what that means is we can play the movie backwards. If it's expanding, then in the past, things were closer together. The universe is more densely packed. And as things get densely packed, they heat up. So the early universe was hot and dense. And you can trace it all the way back 13.7 billion years to the Big Bang. That part makes sense. That's a prediction of the laws of physics. What we don't understand is that the early universe was smoother also. As time goes on, there's no reason for things to start out smooth. You, know, you might, this is a confusing bit, uh, I will admit. In the, the air in this room is smooth, and you know, that, just, that just makes sense. It's high entropy, it's all equally spread out. That, that's what we would expect. So maybe the early universe is like that. Maybe it should just be smooth. 
The early universe is very different from the air in this room because there's a lot more stuff there. Gravity is enormously stronger in the early universe. This is an image, this is a snapshot of what the universe looked like 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is the relic radiation from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. And these differences in colors represent differences in density from place to place in the early universe. But the differences are only one part in 100,000. So if there's 100,000 molecules here, there's 100,000 one here, there's 99,999 here, it's almost perfectly uniform. And the thing is, when the gravity is that strong, things want to come together. They want to form black holes and lumpy structures. To, what you're doing is you're taking 100 billion galaxies worth of stuff, and you're putting it in a region that big, perfectly smooth, literally that big, perfectly smoothly. That is not a random configuration. That's an extremely delicately chosen configuration of the stuff out of which the universe was made. That is low entropy. That is what we would like to explain. So another clue came along in 1998. Not only is the universe expanding, it's accelerating. If you take that galaxy that you looked at and you saw it's moving away from you, now you wait and you come back a billion years later, it's moving away from you faster than it was originally. The galaxies are accelerating away from us. We don't know why this is true, but we have a favorite theory that is probably right called dark energy. Dark energy is just the idea that in every cubic centimeter of space, even if it's completely empty, if you take a little region, you empty it out, there's no light, there's no matter, there's no dark matter, there's no nothing in it, it's empty. You ask, how much energy does that cubic centimeter of space have? And you might say, well, there's zero energy, there's nothing there, it's empty, that's what you just told me. But Einstein says that's not right. There is, there is something called the energy of empty space, the energy intrinsic to space itself. That's what this dark energy stuff is. It doesn't move, it doesn't change from place to place. It's the same today and tomorrow and yesterday and a billion years in the future. It's the same here and in interstellar space and in the Andromeda galaxy. If it's there, how, do we, how would we know? Well, because it makes the universe accelerate. That energy, Einstein says, pushes against the universe. And it, there's a lot of cubic centimeters between us and a distant galaxy, so it's pushing that galaxy away. As time goes on, the galaxy's further away. There are more cubic centimeters. There's more push. The galaxy accelerates away from us. This is our a perpetual expansion. So you might have wondered, well, you know, when I, again, when I was your age, we didn't know what would happen in the future of the universe. We knew there was a Big Bang in the past, but in the future we said, ah, we don't know. It could recollapse. It could expand forever. If this idea is right, it will expand forever. The universe has 13.7 billion years in the past. It has infinity years toward the future, a very big imbalance that you might worry about all by itself. There's no end to the future of the universe. So just to drive this home, here's what the universe looked like one second after the Big Bang. It was hot and dense and smooth. And I picked one second, not randomly. This is the earliest period in the history of the universe from which we have data. The early universe was a nuclear reactor one second after the Big Bang. We see the reaction products and we can measure it so we know what the universe was doing. It looked like this. This is the inside view. Normally you see like the Big Bang is this explosion represented as an explosion in empty space. That's not what it was like. It was the whole universe. So it looked like this. There's no outside vantage point. By 380,000 years later, it cooled and you can see the ripples forming, the slight inhomogeneities, the slight lumpy regions in the universe. And these coalesce. The evolution of the universe turns up the contrast knob until about 10 billion years later, we get stars and galaxies. This is the universe that we have now. But we don't need to be silent about what will happen next. Stars are entropy generating machines. They are taking hydrogen and helium and turning them into heavier elements increasing the entropy of the universe. But they can only do that for so long. They will give up. They will go nova, which I understand is part of a publicity campaign, <laughs> creating complex structures like you and me. So that's a good thing. It's not something to be sad about. Except that they will eventually give up. 10 to the 15 years from now, there will be no more stars. There will just be black holes and rocks. And the rocks will fall into the black holes. So there will be really nothing left but black holes. But that's not the end, because Stephen Hawking, that's a picture of a black hole in case you can't see it. <laughs> in the 1970s, Stephen Hawking explained to us that black holes are not completely black, they radiate. Due to quantum mechanics, black holes give off energy into empty space, and in doing so, they lose energy. So black holes shrink over time. 
And you can figure out how long will it take for the biggest black holes to go away, and the answer is one Google years. This is in the, the good old uh, sense of the word Google before the search engine came along, 10 to the 100 years. And this picture, well, let me turn off the lights. Uh, yeah, there's nothing there. That's really just, <laughs> that's all it is. That's the universe. 10 to the 100 years from now, that's what we're going to be left with, and that will be like that forever. That's the history of the universe we would like to explain. And it's a history where the entropy is going up. This is low entropy. We're now medium entropy. The future will be high entropy. Uh, Google years from now, etc. So that's what we'd like to explain. It's a puzzle. If you randomly pick something the universe could do, it wouldn't look like that. It would look like it was high entropy all along. This orderliness demands an explanation of some sort. That's why we get paid the big bucks. So Boltzmann knew about this. Ludwig Boltzmann, before we knew about the Big Bang, he still knew that he had to explain why the early universe was orderly. But being Boltzmann, he knew something his contemporaries didn't, namely the second law of thermodynamics, the idea that entropy only increases, is really only, it's not really a law, it's just kind of a good idea. It's a probabilistic statement. The reason why entropy increases is because there are many more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. Therefore, entropy will probably increase. Now, this probability is enormously large. But if you wait literally forever, weird things happen. So if the universe lasts forever, it might you know, be smooth and just thermal equilibrium, nothing going on. But if you wait long enough, there will be random, unlikely fluctuations into low entropy configurations. If you took this room and preserved it forever, if you wait long enough, all of the air will be on one side of the room, just for a moment, and then it'll come back not because of any purpose, just because the random motions of the molecules in the room will conspire that way. The amount of time you have to wait before this happens is much, much, much longer than the age of the universe right now. It's not something you have a grant proposal to wait and observe. <laughs> but it will happen according to the laws of physics. So we're used to entropy going up. Boltzmann says if you have a box of gas that lasts forever, really the evolution of entropy is like this graph. Time is going on. It's most of the time in equilibrium, but there are fluctuations downward. And he says, you know, maybe we live here. Maybe the universe is not all there is. Maybe our local region of the universe is just one of those things that happens from time to time. So what he invents is what we now call the multiverse. And what he uses is what we now call the anthropic principle. He says, look, in thermal equilibrium, which is most of the universe, you can't live there. I already gave you the spiel about how life depends on entropy increasing. You, even if most of the universe is like that, we would never see it. If you wait until there are fluctuations and you get a large enough fluctuation for us to exist, that's what we can see. <clears throat> so Boltzmann says there must then be in the universe, which is in thermal equilibrium as a whole and therefore dead, here and there, relatively small regions the size of our galaxy, which we call worlds, which during the relatively short time of eons, this is a little physicist dry humor there, deviate significantly from thermal equilibrium. So the anthropic principle is the thing that says if you have a big universe with many different things going on, we will only ever be part of the regions of the universe that can allow for us to exist. That's not controversial. The controversial part is, do we live in a universe where there are many different things going on far away? And of course, Boltzmann didn't know about the Big Bang, etc. So it's a good idea. It could have been right. And in fact, Boltzmann was not the first one to come up with this idea. If you do a literature search, you go all the way back to 50 BC. <clears throat> Lucretius was a Roman poet, and he was in a precisely the same circumstance as Boltzmann was in. He was a believer in atoms at a time when most people didn't believe in atoms. And he was faced with the same dilemma. If the universe is made of particles mindlessly bumping into each other, how do you explain all this complexity and this glorious uh, progress that we seem to see around us? And he hit upon Boltzmann's explanation. He says, you have to imagine this is in Latin, in dactylic hexameter. <clears throat> For surely the atoms did not hold counsel, assigning order to each, flexing their keen minds with questions of place and motion and who goes where. Rather, they shuffled and jumbled in many ways, and in the course of endless time, they are buffeted, driven along, chancing upon all motions and combinations. At last, they fall into such an arrangement as would create this universe. So again, if you allow for time to be eternal, for the universe to last forever, the local part of the universe in which we live is not the whole thing. It's just the kind of unlikely arrangement that will happen from time to time. 
Again, a scientific theory because it makes predictions. You can test those predictions. It fails. This theory is not right. We are not a random fluctuation in thermal equilibrium. This was figured out in 1931 by Arthur Eddington, who says, look, look, you know, he doesn't blame Lucretius, but he says Boltzmann should have known better. If you look at this picture, yes, there are fluctuations in the entropy. It goes down and it goes up, and maybe we could be there. But there's only a small number of big fluctuations. There are a lot of small fluctuations. So therefore, if you say, well, I can't exist in thermal equilibrium, I can't you know, thrive and have a life in a universe which is absolutely the highest entropy it could have, this theory says that the universe should fluctuate into a minimum amount of organization that lets me exist. The rest of the universe should still be chaotic. There's no reason for the rest of the universe to fluctuate into some low entropy thing. So I could fluctuate into a galaxy. I could create a galaxy out of the surrounding chaos. I wouldn't need 100 billion galaxies. And then you think, you know, I don't even need a galaxy. I could just have the solar system. We don't need all those other stars in the galaxy. And then you think, I could just have this room. If you and I, we're all here, let's take our sense data as reliable. We believe that we're here. You see each other, including the fact that you have memories you have impressions, you think that outside this room there's something called Villanova University and something called Pennsylvania. In this scenario, given that that is true, with overwhelming probability when you walk outside it will be thermal equilibrium. There will be no other buildings. Your memories of the past have randomly fluctuated into your head. Carl Sagan once said, in order to make an apple pie, you must first invent the universe. He was not right in this scenario. His reasoning was that, of course, to make an apple pie, you need apples, which means an orchard, which means a biosphere, which means the earth, which means a second generation star, et cetera, et cetera. In this scenario, it's much easier just to make the apple pie as a random fluctuation. It's much harder to first make an apple orchard and all that and then let it evolve into an apple pie. And the same thing is true for this room. And then you think, well, this, I don't even need you guys. I could fluctuate into existence, or if you like, an observer, a conscious being, could randomly be assembled from the unpredictable motions of the chaotic particles in thermal equilibrium, and you can count how many observers like that come into existence, and it's enormously larger than observers like you and me and people who think that there really is something outside other than thermal equilibrium. So you take this to the reductio ab absurdum and you call it, you just said, you don't even need the whole observer, you just need a brain. A brain can fluctuate into existence just long enough to look around and go, ha, huh, thermal equilibrium, and then it will die. And the overwhelming majority of conscious observers in the universe are these disembodied Boltzmann brains. So this is a sufficiently provocative idea. Again, it's not right. It's wrong. We're not Boltzmann brains, but it's a good idea. It's a fun idea. So the New York Times wrote a story about it. And this is the illustration from that story. It's labeled incorrectly. This is not Boltzmann's brain. Boltzmann's brain is underneath the tombstone in Vienna. <laughs> this is a Boltzmann brain, which is what a typical observer would be like in this kind of theory, but it's not right. However, when the story came out in the New York Times, those, I was quoted, and some other people were quoted in the story, and all of us who were quoted got an irate letter from someone who had read this article, George Wing. Uh, George is 10 years old. Here is his letter. <laughs> I will translate it for you. He was very excited, and his spelling was not very good. And George says, I don't know if you exist, but I do. I do not agree with your article, and I do not believe that mumbo jumbo. If you do, well, it's a disturbing thought, but I know how to deal with it. I will not let the world disappear under my nose, but if you do, I can't say I'm sorry. <laughs> Sincerely, a 10-year-old who knows a little more than some people, George Wing. P.S. Some people have a little too much time. <laughs> So I'm looking forward, George was 10 years old, I'm looking forward to, you know, about 10 years from now, he'll be applying to graduate school, and I will blackball him as insufficiently <laughs> respectful of his elders. I think that's how it works. The point is, George, like many readers of the article, missed the point. We're not saying the universe is like this. We're saying that it, had the universe been like that, it would have been very different. We need to do better. We need to come up with a better scheme. So uh, we don't know. Let me, so everything that I've set up to this point has been the truth. <laughs> it's been correct. What I'm saying from now on, we're in a speculation territory. We don't know. None of us know 
why the early universe had a low entropy. It is our job to come up with models consistent with the laws of physics that might explain that fascinating fact. My own favorite model I will tell you about simply says the Big Bang is not the beginning. You know, uh, uh, an unbroken egg is low entropy, right? It's much fewer arrangements that look like an unbroken egg that look, then look like scrambled eggs. And yet, when you open your refrigerator and see an unbroken egg in there, you do not go, wow, how unlikely to find that low entropy configuration in my refrigerator. <laughs> and that's because you know that the egg is not a closed system. The egg is not alone in the universe, a randomly selected configuration of its molecules. The egg came out of a chicken. So, I'm saying, well, maybe the universe came out of a universal chicken. <laughs> maybe the universe that we see is not all there is. There is a multiverse similar to what Boltzmann talked about, but not exactly the same. Boltzmann's problem was he was imagining the universe is usually in its maximum disorderly state in thermal equilibrium, and we were a dip downward in entropy. Maybe we can do different than that by creating a different set of dynamics. Now, you might think to yourself, well, I know better than that because I've read A Brief History of Time or some other popular cosmology book, and they taught me that there isn't anything before the Big Bang, that asking what happened at the Big Bang is like asking what is north of the North Pole. It's a nonsensical question. Einstein explained that to us, you might say, but that's not the truth. You, it is true that people say that all the time. It is not correct. What's actually correct is that the Big Bang is not the beginning of the universe. It's the end of our knowledge of the universe. The Big Bang is a prediction from general relativity, the theory of space and time, that is handed down to us by this guy, Albert Einstein. I think it's important in these talks to show pictures of Einstein when he was young. You know, you always see he was in his dotage when you see the pictures with the hair going in the sweaters and everything. But when he was inventing these theories that changed our views of the universe, he was a sharp-dressed young man. And what he said was that what you and I perceive as gravity is really the curvature of space-time. Space-time is not fixed. It has its own life. It has its own dynamics. It can change in response to matter and energy in the universe. And that's what you and I perceive as gravity. So he gave us equations, and you plug into the equations, and you find that in the early universe, the curvature of space and time was infinity at the moment of the Big Bang. <laughs> so that's, what that means is that general relativity is not right at that point. It means that the theory has given up. It says a nonsensical answer, which means we need a better theory. It might be that the better theory says, yes, that's just the beginning. That's where the universe was created. But it might also be says that, well, that's just something that was a temporary moment in the history of the universe. There was something before that we can talk about. Many different possibilities along these lines are being pursued. So my particular angle is to say, what we want to do is we want to think like Lucretius and Boltzmann. We want to say, look, start with what we would imagine to be a likely configuration of the universe, a natural state for the universe to be in, which in our language is a high entropy configuration of the universe. So you can ask yourself, what would a high entropy configuration look like? The good news is we know what it will look like because that's what's happening to the universe. The entropy is increasing. Just wait around. A Google years from now, the universe will be in a high entropy state. And what does that look like? Empty space, nothing around. Because something that Boltzmann didn't know is that the universe can expand. It can empty out. It can dilute away. This is going to happen for a very long time. And ultimately, there'll be nothing but empty space going on. That would be the most natural configuration for the universe to be in. So then you're tempted to say, OK, I have a good reason why we don't live in empty space. There's nothing there to do the living. It's empty. But sadly, or, or happily, I'm not sure, that's not exactly true. Another thing that Stephen Hawking told us in the 1970s is not only does quantum mechanics say that black holes will radiate particles, quantum mechanics also says that empty space radiates particles if there is dark energy. If the energy of empty space is zero, then the temperature is zero. But if the energy of empty space is a little bit above zero, there's a small temperature. It's very, very, very tiny, 10 to the minus 30 degrees. So it's much colder than it is out there today. But it's not zero. So think about what this means. This means that the universe lasts forever, and there's a temperature that never goes away. So in fact, it sounds an awful lot like Boltzmann's setup. The universe is a box of gas at a fixed temperature that lasts forever. And you will get, you expect to get Boltzmann brains. You expect to get random fluctuations into craziness all in our future. 
This is a huge problem for modern cosmology that we don't know the answer to. We have a very successful model of the universe that predicts that most observers in that universe are disembodied brains who have randomly fluctuated out of the surrounding chaos in almost infinitely far in the future, 10 to the 10 to the 30 years to the future. Doesn't seem to be right. But maybe we can take this lemon and make lemonade out of it. Because it's not only the stuff that is in the universe that can do the fluctuating. So what Hawking says is that photons and electrons and neutrinos and all those elementary particles out of which we are made will pop into existence very rarely, but occasionally even in empty space. I want to marry that to what Einstein says, which is that space and time have their own dynamics. So space itself can be fluctuating <coughs> along with the stuff inside space. So there's a hypothetical process known as baby universe creation, which says that if you wait long enough, this is space and it fluctuates a little bit. And if you get everything just right, space can fluctuate in such a way that there's a little bubble with a lot of energy in it. It's unlikely for that to happen, but you have forever to wait. Eventually it might happen. And that little bubble, which is sort of conveniently egg-shaped, can pinch off from the rest, rest of the universe and go its own way. The point is that this little bubble, if it has the right kind of energy in it, can expand at an accelerated rate. It can be filled with a temporary form of dark energy that pushes space apart. And remember, the nice thing about dark energy is that the energy density, the density per cubic centimeter does not go down as the universe expands. So you get a bigger and bigger and bigger bubble full of energy, and that energy can eventually then decay into matter and radiation and the kind of stuff that we're made out of. This acceleration process smooths everything out. So what's going to happen to this bubble? It will expand by a huge amount, and then it will turn into an extremely smooth, hot, dense configuration of matter and energy. And then that will expand and cool off. In other words, just like our Big Bang. This baby universe could be the birth of the universe that we find ourselves in. It's not Boltzmann's situation, because there the entropy went down. Here, the rest of the universe is unperturbed. This is a whole other universe full of entropy. The entropy of the whole shebang is going up in this configuration. <coughs> the reason there's an arrow of time in this way of looking at things is because the universe can always increase its entropy by creating more universes. We are the spin-off. We are the, uh, the extra unanticipated consequence of the fact that the universe is trying to increase its entropy without bound. And the crucial thing here is without bound. The nice thing that Einstein showed is that the total energy in a compact, closed bubble of universe is exactly zero. That sounds weird because there's stuff inside there, and surely that stuff has energy. But the curvature of space-time has negative energy. And it turns out you just go through the equations. It's exactly enough to compensate for the positive energy of the stuff inside. So making a new universe is not expensive. It is what Alan Guth calls the ultimate free lunch. You can make a universe and then make another universe and go on like that forever. This is the best I could do going into Google image search for a bubble making machine, but this is the idea. The universe is a bubble making machine. It makes new universes and it never shuts off. Every new bubble makes the entropy of the multiverse go up. The multiverse is just a collection of all these different bubble universes. The best thing about this scenario is that you can play the game in both directions of time. So here now is a picture of the universe. This is what the universe should look like if this process were not real. It should be empty and quiet. And this is time going in the vertical direction. So you start with an empty universe, what you would have thought would be a high entropy likely configuration. And you evolve it, and you make little bubbles that grow up into baby universes, and they have their own arrows of time in each bubble as it expands and cools. But also, because the fundamental laws of physics work the same forward and backward in time, you can play that game backwards, and you should create little bubbles that expand in that direction. They're unrelated to each other. They're baby, they're children universes. They never talk to their parents or their siblings. But their arrow of time is pointing in the opposite direction. Here, these guys would say that this is the past, this is the future. They would say that we live in their past. They would say, Sorry. We would say that they live in our past. And you might worry about some Benjamin Button craziness going on here, but the good news is we can't talk to them. Why? 
because they're in our past. You can no more talk to these guys than you can talk to Napoleon. Okay? In fact, it's harder to talk to these guys because they're a gajillion years in the past. So the great thing about this scenario is that the difference between past and future just happens. It arises naturally. The whole multiverse is symmetric. The far, far future looks the same as the far, far past. The, this asymmetry, this breaking of the symmetry between past and future is just because we don't see the whole universe. We see this little part of it. Now what you should be asking, probably you are asking yourselves, is how would I ever know if this crazy nonsense about the multiverse is true? It is supposed to be science after all. As much as I love philosophy, we got the experiments stuff that we need to worry about. Well, it's hard. I don't know. The short version is this scenario that I'm outlining here, I can't tell you what experiment to do to rule it out, which means that it is not yet a fully grown up and ready to, for prime time scientific theory. But it could be. We're working on it. We need to develop the theory better before we can make such a judgment. So let me give you some examples. Some people have a slight modification of this theory where these bubbles actually don't pinch off and go in different universes, but remain embedded in the, in, the in the parent universe. If that's true, these bubbles can literally bump into each other. And there could be another tiny universe that bumped into our universe sometime in the past and left some remnant evidence here. So this sounds like science fiction, but people are combing through the data looking for evidence of other universes that bumped into ours in the past. You could see some large difference in the relic radiation from the Big Bang if you're in one theory of the universe versus another one. If we develop these theories well enough, we might be able to make quantitative predictions for the early universe that we see. And finally, you could just figure out the fundamental laws of physics. Right now, we don't understand how gravity plays nicely with quantum mechanics and particle physics in the real world. We're trying to build, we're doing experiments. This is a Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland outside Geneva. They're smashing protons together at energies that have never been achieved before here on Earth. And they're looking for new laws of physics. If we understand those laws better, we may be able to put together a picture that helps us predict whether or not these universes happen. So here's a summary for cocktail party purposes. If there's any question I didn't yet ask, I did write a book. You can buy the book. That makes writers happy. Uh, three things we know and one thing we don't know. The first thing we know is that the increase of entropy in the universe is why there's an arrow of time. That is settled. The reason why there's a difference between past and future, you're born and then you grow older and then you die, it's ultimately because the disorderliness, the entropy of the universe is increasing toward the future. Why? Because it was very low to start with. That is true and we understand it and it, it's accepted. The third true thing is that we don't know why the early universe had a low entropy. Nobody knows. Some people might come here and tell you they know. Don't believe them. They're being overly optimistic. We're exploring a space of different possibilities. We're trying to connect them to other theories and to the data, but we're not done yet. The thing we don't know is what is the right answer. One thing I didn't mention, but is absolutely possible, is that there is no answer beyond the brute fact of the low entropy early universe. It might just be that the universe was like that, and it's our job to deal with it, not to explain it. Or maybe at a slightly more sophisticated level, maybe there's some theory of initial condition says that, well, it was like that because that's the simplest blah, blah, blah in some bigger picture. This is what Stephen Hawking, for example, would advocate, but we just don't know yet. My own favorite idea is that there, the Big Bang is not a unique once and for all event in the history of the universe. It's just one of those things that happens. We're part of a much larger ensemble in which the symmetry of time is not actually broken. But we don't know yet. We need to do a lot more work. I give it, you know, I don't know, five or six years. We'll get it all figured out. I'll come back and tell you then. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent question. So there was a paper that literally came out just a few weeks ago. Uh, what happens is you can't see it very well from this picture on the top. But if another universe but bounces into ours, the shape of the universe is really the, the shape of there's a boundary, and it's a sphere. So when it bounces into ours, it leaves an imprint on our early universe that is circular. And what you would do is you would find some very subtle artifacts in this relic radiation from the Big Bang in a circular pattern. So what people did was uh, they, you know, it, you might say, well, I don't see any. But that is not quite science-y enough. <laughs> what you need to do is you need to do a bunch of simulations saying if this happened in a certain way, what would the signal be? How big would it be? What are the st statistics of it? 
And they actually found that in the real data, there are four spots that are consistent with being circles from universes that bumped into aliens. They are not so clear that you can say, oh, they must be circles where universes bumped into ours, but they are candidates. This uh, is from the WMAP satellite from NASA. Right now, there's another satellite from the European Space Agency called Planck, which is doing a much more high-resolution view of the cosmic microwave background. So they will look at these four candidates and tell us whether or not they fit the pattern that you'd expect from those bubble collisions. Other questions? Yes. So is your opinion that we were birthed from a multiverse or that we could potentially birth a universe? Excellent question. My opinion, the question was, uh, or were we born from the multiverse or could we get, have our own descendants? Could we have our own baby universes? And my answer is both. So we were born, yeah, we were born from a bigger universe that was quiet and empty, <coughs> if this theory is right. But then we empty out over time and we become quiet and boring and we give birth to more little baby universes. And that would go on ad infinitum if this kind of scenario was right. Yes? Uh, piggybacking on to that comment, I fail to see how this escapes the arrow of time if you could just say that the parent universe has uh, an arrow of time pointing towards more birth baby universes. Wouldn't that be increase in energy there, in which case you can go back from it? Sure, I think that's, that's a good point. So this universe here, this part called empty quiet parent universe does not have an arrow of time. If you were there, <coughs> your surroundings would be absolutely the same from moment to moment in time. So the, the, the sneaky thing about the scenario is that it says that the entropy of the universe can always go up. It might be finite or it might be infinite, but it can always increase. Just like if you imagine uh, all of the real numbers from minus infinity to infinity, you could multiply them by two. So they all get further away from each other, there's still an infinite number of them. So if this scenario makes sense, what it's trying to say is that there is no state of thermal equilibrium. This universe is as close as you can get by having only one piece of universe. But really, if you let it evolve, it will give rise to more little pieces, and it will give rise to more little pieces down there. So the, way, the reason why you don't get collisions from outside is because you start with only one piece. And you can say, well, maybe I should start with many pieces, or maybe an infinite number of pieces. And I think that's correct. I think you could do that. Uh, I still think the general form of evolution toward the future would be that you would get more and more universes. So the whole idea here is that you can't reach equilibrium because there's always room to grow. Uh, You're totally not a student, but I'll call on you. I, I was. You are. <laughs> I paid the tuition. That's true. You paid the tuition. <laughs> um, the, uh, in, in your, your time symmetric so you have the past starting, I guess, time zero in the multiverse is in that central slice, and time is progressing in the future in both directions. Or do, you, or do you consider the possibility that, or is there a possibility that time is rolling backward, if you will, events are taking place uh, you know, before causes? Right. So that's another good question. So I need to distinguish between the two notions of time. There's a coordinate you can put on here. It would be convenient to say this is t equals zero. This is plus 1, 2, et cetera, minus 1, minus 2, or plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, minus 1. It doesn't matter because it's symmetric. But when you say events precede causes, you're using a language that is only appropriate to those little regions where there is a local arrow of time. In every region, events precede causes. So even Boltzmann knew about this. So if you look about Boltzmann's scenario, you see this picture. Sometimes we would say from this coordinate system, entropy goes down. Sometimes it goes up. So we could be here. We could also be here on the other side. But given that we were either there or there, you would always call the past the region in which the entropy was low, the direction in which the entropy was low. So no one ever feels that things are funny and omelets are turning into eggs, because the whole way the setup goes is that this, this change of entropy determines all the other arrows of time. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned the dark energy. Yeah. That's a good question. People have asked that. Um, that's a good question, by the way, means I know the answer to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent question. Yes. Um, all right, here it is the dark energy. So, uh, this is something that fills empty space. It's important to space itself. And so, it, it sort of has some vague rhetorical 
reminiscence of what we used to call the ether, the medium through which light was purported to propagate. Isn't this the same as that? The answer is this is the opposite of that for the following reason. The ether was uh, predicted by theorists and could not possibly be observed when any experimenter looked for it. This stuff was uh, not predicted by theorists, and the observers found it. They found that the universe was accelerating, so we needed to invoke it. The ether set the rest frame for the universe. You could say, I am moving at five miles per hour with respect to the ether, or not. Dark energy does not do that. Dark energy looks the same no matter what speed you're moving at. Dark energy is consistent with relativity. It does not set a special standard of rest for the universe. It's just the, the energiness that the universe has. It comes out of relativity rather than being inconsistent with it. Having said that, let me point out that if anyone has a better theory than this, well, don't tell me. Write it up, because you can get a lot of credit for it, because we're this theory fits the data very, very well, but we would all love to get something even better. Other questions? Yes. One point you mentioned how um, a new baby universe was created and how mm -hmm. uh, dark energy causes it to expand and in the end the uh, decays to radiation and matter and so on. Right. Um, does this basically mean infinite energy? Yes. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, <coughs> in general relativity, energy is not conserved. You can get new energy via the curvature of space-time. This is not anything new. Uh, if, if you imagine a universe with nothing but photons in it, nothing but light. Okay? It expands, so if you follow some region of expanding universe, the number of photons stays the same, but the energy per photon goes down because the photons get stretched and they lose energy. So energy going down is just as much a violation of conservation of energy as energy going up. But it doesn't really bother us because, well, yeah, the energy going down, that happens. I've seen that happen. When you have dark energy in that same region, the energy goes up. It's not a violation of the laws of physics. It's a prediction of the laws of physics. It's, uh, there's a balance between the expansion rate of the universe and the amount of energy inside. So, yeah, you create energy without limit. Useless energy, high entropy energy, will not solve our dependence on foreign oil sources. <laughs> but it is an infinite amount of energy, yeah. Ah, that's, so that's very good, because that was a subtle point that I was just hoping you would not notice because I was talking fast. Uh, there's dark energy and there's dark energy. Dark energy sort of, most of the time, is perfectly constant. It doesn't change from point to point in space, from moment to moment in time. But there can be temporary dark energy. There can be a phase transition, like the boiling of water, where you go from the liquid phase to the gaseous phase. Likewise, dark energy, if you wait long enough, under the right circumstances, certain forms of dark energy can decay away overnight. So you have dark energy, dark energy, dark energy, pushing the universe, expanding, etc., and then boom, it converts into ordinary matter and radiation for some reason, not, not just magical reasons, but because that's what the equations say. So it's relatively easy to imagine that happening in our early universe. This is the theory of inflation that Alan Guth invented. Uh, it could even happen to the dark energy we have now. We don't know whether the dark energy we have now is truly permanent and here to stay, or whether it's temporary and will go away. I remember you showing a picture of the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. And I learned about it a little bit in my physics class, but I was just really unsure how this related to the whole space-time continuum idea. This is the, this is, so the question is, are you just like trying to score some cheap empiricist points by showing a picture of an experiment <laughs> after your whole talk was about the multiverse? And the answer is, you know, it's almost that, but it's not quite that bad. The point is that I think that the most probable way that we will learn whether a picture like this is correct or incorrect, plausible or implausible, is actually not through observing, through getting phenomenally lucky and observing a splotch in the early universe that is the remnant of another universe bumping into ours. I think it's much more likely that what we will do is improve our understanding of the fundamental laws of physics to the point where we can say, yes, baby universes get created, or no, they don't. And the way to do that is to look in regimes we haven't looked, parts of the universe we haven't looked, energy scales, luminosity scales that we haven't looked in yet. So the hope is that by crashing protons together, not that we create a new universe, 
but that we create new particles or new interactions between the particles that we know of that give us a clue to some new way to organize our thinking about the universe, some new symmetry, some new dynamical principle. Uh, it, this might be, this is not a short-term project. It might, you know, Large Hadron Collider is a short-term project. It's coming up with data this year. And by short term, its lifetime will be the next 50 years. The project I have in mind may be a 50-year project, or it might be a 300-year project. Yes? Um, on the way over here, I was listening to the radio, and there happened to be an interview with Brian Green on, and he was talking about the Large Hadron Collider. And he was saying that it's possible that in these proton collisions that some of the energy could leave our universe. Mm -hmm. It does. So the question is, you know, well, did everyone hear that? I don't know. I could repeat the whole thing. Brian Green was mentioning that at the Large Hadron Collider, you can imagine energy leaking out of our visible universe into other universes or into other dimensions of space perpendicular to the three dimensions that we know and love. Uh, all of that should be part of the final picture. It may be that the final picture makes really intimate, important usage of the concept of extra dimensions or other universes on other brains right next to ours. Or it could be that that's actually an interesting thing but has nothing to do with this. So it's all part of one big picture. We, we do need to understand how gravity and quantum mechanics play together. And all of these aspects uh, under that big umbrella are being simultaneously investigated with the hope that someday they all fit together. So it's not necessary, but they might be related. Yes, the um, elegant universe. You know, first before, uh, Jenna Levin. Jenna Levin, yes. And before. Oh, I like that book. <laughs> <laughs> Hardcover. Oh, absolutely. So, my question. Uh, yes, what uh, Brian Green was saying. <clears throat> Right. Where contemporary 21st century physicists, mathematicians are headed. Okay. Or two, are you still, are you still as uh, uh, Jan Levin, and you know her by her proper name? We go way back. Well, yes, I can, I can answer you because I have a, a Villanova education, so I know all the <laughs> terms used. So I do think that, you know, not to be too glib about it, but the, it's probably a mistake to take too seriously 
analogies between modern cosmology, whatever it is, and the views of the classicists, the modernists, the postmodernists. Because if you think about the simple question of what could time be like? Well, it could go forever in both directions. It could go forever in one direction, but not the other. It could be finite. It could be a circle. Those are the only possibilities, and all of them exist in some pre-existing mythology or philosophy or something like that. And so when we finally think out the right answer, there's no credit that the people who guessed right got because it's a completely different process of getting there. I don't think that it's, it is in any way going to be reassuring or satisfactory if we end up just saying, oh, it doesn't matter what happened before the Big Bang. I think that as scientists, what we look for are compact explanations of as much data as we can find. The best scientific theory is the shortest uh, set of statements that encompasses the largest number of phenomena. So if the, end, if the end of this 300 years from now was that we say, yeah, there was probably something before the Big Bang, but we really don't know what it is, to me, we failed. That is not good enough. I want to do better than that. I don't like this idea just because I can draw a pretty picture. I like this idea because it's the beginning of trying to explain something more quantitatively. Okay, and I, I really have to introduce the fourth alternative that we didn't capture in the three. And the fourth alternative would seem to be Kant's alternative that time is a pure intuition that must accompany our experience of all things in the empirical world. Right. I mean, that is obviously crazy. <laughs> Let me, let me let get some other people get a chance to ask, ask questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Um, what is your thoughts on the theory of dark flow as an alternative explanation? Yeah, you know, there was a, there was a dark flow uh, discussion because if you look at galaxies in the universe, some of them are moving <coughs> consistently in some directions uh, in a way that you wouldn't quite anticipate. I think it's like a little minor thing that is not clear whether it's statistically significant or not, but it's not an alternative. It is part of a story. The alternatives to dark energy would be something that does change from point to point, but only very slowly. Or perhaps that we don't understand gravity, that Einstein's equation is not quite correct. And all of these alternatives are being explored very, very strongly. I, <clears throat> that's what I do for a living. And so far, the smart money is just on the dark energy uh, model, as I explained it. Yeah, this is a, a great question because uh, this is not as great as the other questions because here the answer is I don't know. <laughs> the question is, so I'm saying that, that the Big Bang general relativity is wrong. It predicts its own downfall. There's two ways to go. Maybe you really do need to really marry general relativity to quantum mechanics, the, the holy grail of theoretical physics, finding a quantum theory of gravity, a theory of everything, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that is what is necessary to uh, understand this moment. Or... Maybe not. Maybe there's another theory of gravity very close to general relativity, but not exactly the same, which still isn't quite compatible with quantum mechanics, but yet smooths out all the infinities here at the singularity. I think that both of these possibilities are completely on the table right now. Yes. Um, is it possible if the theory of um, multiple baby universes that come from a parent universe is true, is it possible to actually enter or have any sort of uh, experience of that universe uh, in a way that we acknowledge their existence other mm -hmm. than the imprint? Wouldn't that be entering <coughs> some, uh, in some other arrow of time and violating uh, our understanding of space and time? So the short answer here is I don't know. But I can be a little bit more specific. If this particular version of the multiple universes theory is right, then the answer is no. Different universes cannot communicate with each other in any way. So that may very well be that is a consistent, plausible answer that we should keep in mind. There are other versions of the theory where the universes are really right next to each other. I mean, there's a version of the theory where there is another universe literally 
uh, about a tenth of a millimeter away from us in a direction that is not one of the three directions that we know and love, and it's right there, and we can't talk to it in any way we know, now know. But there it's certainly plausible to imagine that we could be able to talk to it at some future state of technology. So I think that all those uh, things are on the table. It wouldn't undermine notions of the arrow of time or anything like that necessarily, but I'll have to wait for the data to come in before I draw any firm conclusions. Yes? Um, so going with the, uh, the theory that the little bubbles of big universes break off, does that imply that they all have the same initial conditions, or could there exist different initial conditions? Yeah, that's a very good question. You notice that these are different colors. That means they could be different initial conditions. Uh, or not. So I think that once again, our level of ignorance is such that I can cook up versions of this model where every one of these big bangs is exactly the same. But I can also cook up a landscape of possibilities. And people have taken very seriously the idea that there's actually 10 to the 500 different kinds of universes that you could make out of a process like this. In which case, you not only have to explain the conditions that we see around us, but the laws of physics we see around us. By a different kind of universe, I mean one with different numbers of dimensions, different particles, different interactions between those particles. All that is possible. Yes. I think you already had a question. Let me make sure I didn't get anyone twice. Yes. Uh, this might not be a great question as well, but um, you mentioned biological evolution and the Big Bang multiple times. Where do you see creationism fitting into all of that? Uh, I see creationism in fitting into it in the box next to it that says things that are not true. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I see. But he was first. Uh, yeah, if, um, if like energy or matter can flash in to existence in empty space, uh, could it also happen in, say, a dense plasma like the early universe and like something like that explain the heterogeneity of the universe? Um, yes and no. So yes, if you believe that something like this could happen in empty space, there's no reason to, in fact, it would be easier for this to happen in excited space where things are going on. The problem is the chance that this happens in empty space, in order for way to this, if you just stood here and waited for this to ha happen, you would wait 10 to the 10 to the 20 years, which is a long time to wait. So the chance that it explains any sort of observable thing in the universe is very, very small. The chance that our whole universe could be this bubble is what I'm, I'm definitely shooting for, yes. Yeah, if time is, if you've got the arrow of time as a big arrow of time, and you think of, say, time as a river, in a river you see little back eddies and fluctuations and so forth, uh, what do you think of the odds of having back arrows, a little eddies of time, little bits of the universe <coughs> with time going the wrong way? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, I know the answer. It's small. What are the chances that you can have a little bit of decrease of entropy is essentially what you're asking. So if your system only has three particles in it, that would happen all the time. If your system has 10 particles in it, it would take a long time. If your system has 60 particles in it, it would take the age of the universe. If it has Avogadro's number of particles, you know, 10 to something particles, it's not going to happen in 10 to the 23. I know the number. It's not going to happen <laughs> in any interesting time scale. All right, so we're running out of time. So I, we have time for one more really good question. All right, confidence. Yeah, that, sorry, that was just me being sloppy. Okay, okay, so they can't communicate with each other. What dynamics would you expect between them? Would they have some sort of gravity, you know, et cetera? The, to be more careful, there's different versions of this kind of theory. In my favorite version, they really couldn't talk to each other. In other versions, they can actually smack into each other. So the uh, kinds of interactions you would get is just sort of an influx of energy in the form of a bubble hitting our universe at some very early moment of time. And so you would see like either a decrement or a, an, an increase of, en of energy in some region of the universe. And it would look like a bubble and it would grow and then it would sort of dissolve away and it would leave a circular imprint in, the er in that early times. Um, I don't think that there's any uh, theory like this, which has both universes existing and continuing to exist next to each other and talking to each other. Uh, you know, one universe wins. 
The blue universe won, the red universe lost in this particular picture. That's, a, that's the easiest kind of setup you could have here, but no one is going to pretend that they know enough to give you the definitive answer about whether or not we can talk to other universes, which is a great point to end on. Thank you very much for coming.